about uh, A.R. Scorpio, which has been an obsession of mine and, uh, and indeed Steve Potter as well for, for some time. Uh, and then I'm going to finish off with some prospects for the future. So uh, the SALT Transient Program began uh, back in 2016. Uh, it was the first of, um, I think now, two large uh, science programs on SALT. Um, and it's grown to a sizable allocation per semester, typically in the 200 to 300,000 uh, second allocation. Um, with a high fraction of the time in the highest priority class, which is really what you need when you, you need to do um, target of opportunity follow-ups from, from rapid discoveries. And this has allowed us to do a lot of work uh, reacting to uh, alerts from a number of different sources, uh, both ground-based and space-based. So for example, X-ray and gamma rays in space. Um, the likes of Assassin um, uh, ground-based telescopes and, and Gaia as well as a transient program. Um, so observations can typically be uh, obtained uh, fairly quickly um, and, uh, and the data also obtained very quickly. So it's, it's been quite successful in, in turning around results. And uh, we have over 40 publications now since the program began. Um, it's a multi-institutional, multi-partner program. So a number of South African institutions, uh, also several of the US, uh, sorry, so several of the SALT partners, um, Poland, India, the UK uh, SALT Consortium, Wisconsin. So a total of about 36 um, co-investigators, uh, including up to 12 graduate students, although some of them have come and gone and, and um, uh, uh, um, transferred into postdocs. Um, and now we're also expanding to include uh, other participants outside of the BRICS partnership through uh, our bilateral science uh, programs with different countries. So um, the program really is quite varied and it reflects the science interests of, uh, of the collaboration. Um, but basically, it's attempting to look in this sort of phase space of uh, characteristic timescales of, of transients and their energies. And um, a lot of these are, are focused on things we already know about. Um, and so some of the most uh, energetic uh, transients in the universe, like gamma ray bursts, uh, supernovae, um, but also to uh, more um, nearby, less luminous, but still interesting objects like uh, X-ray transients within our galaxy, uh, cataclysmic variables, novae, and so on. Uh, and as I said earlier, we, we find a lot of these, uh, or we're following up a lot of these events that have been discovered by a variety of different facilities uh, that we either have access to or, or the data is publicly available. Uh, and one of the recent sources of transients has been from Irizita, which is this uh, instrument flown on the Spectrum Rontgen Gamma satellite, which is a joint Russian US mission. Um, and it contains uh, two instruments, one which is a joint instrument by Germany and, um, and Russia called Irizita. And the, the other one is a, a hard, uh, X-ray detector uh, that the Russians um, have developed. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the work that's just started on follow-up of Eurozeta sources. Um, so the things I've highlighted in this slide in red are basically the things I'm going to talk about today. Um, there's not enough time to talk about all the other ones, but there's equally interesting results, particularly in the Novi um, and also uh, flaring blazars, which I see uh, some of the people in the audience like uh, Brian Van Solen and Marcus Butcher, uh, they're people that are leading this um, aspect of the SALT um, transient program. And in more recent times, we've also been involved in follow-up of gravitational wave sources, particularly from the uh, Virgo LIGO uh, 03 campaign, which of course finished earlier this year, uh, a little bit prematurely because of COVID. Um, and uh, also more recently with the 
instigation of uh, of the Thundercat program following Meerkat's um, commissioning. Uh, and these sources from these um, uh, alerts are, are now being followed up as well within the program. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is this source, which is a called a gamma ray burst uh, that happened. The name is just simply the date. So it happened on the 21st of December last year. Um, and GRBs, uh, as I said, they're the most uh, energetic of uh, events um, in the universe. And SALT has uh, observed a few of these, but not many, typically because of the fact that they fade so rapidly once they're detected. But uh, you have to be really on the ball and be in the right place at the right time to, to obtain uh, observations of them because they fade so rapidly. Um, the exception was in this, so most of them we don't really have a chance because by the time SALT is ready to observe the optical afterglow, if there is one, it's typically faded bit to beyond detectability. But in the case of this particular one, it was a long bright GRB which reached 10th magnitude, quite extreme. And so that really led to this opportunity of doing something quite unique for gamma ray burst follow-up, namely to conduct spectropolarimetry of this particular GRB. So um, what's presented here is uh, a fairly complicated light curve that shows uh, basically the optical light curve from, uh, from the master facility um, at Sutherland. This, uh, fairly modest two 40 centimeter telescopes, um, which um, detected it uh, only a matter of about 40 seconds after um, the swift burst detector uh, first alerted that this burst had gone off. And so the points up here around 10th magnitude were taken with what's called a wide field camera on the master telescope. And then later, uh, these points in blue were taken with the, um, uh, the, the main telescopes and the points in orange later with a telescope in, uh, in Argentina that took over after it had disappeared from our skies in South Africa. And then the last points which are shown in green are just the publicly reported um, later photometric measurements. And you can see that the decline is quite complicated. Uh, it shows a sort of typical power law, but there are breaks in the power law and this interesting sort of plateau region um, where basically the object was fairly constant, even re-brightening a little bit uh, over a period of about um, 10,000 seconds. Um, and so because uh, it was so bright uh, and also it occurred uh, in time for us to be able to quickly schedule salt observations, we we're able to observe it um, a couple of hours after the event was first discovered. And this vertical line here shows where SALT was able to observe it. And then about um, nine hours later, uh, the VLT also was able to observe it, um, both with uh, X-Shooter doing um, high resolution spectroscopy. But for the purposes of this, uh, I'm gonna be talking about the spectropolarimetry that was done with the the FOURS instrument on, on the VLT. Um, and so, <coughs> excuse me, the results of this um, have now led to a paper that was submitted uh, um, recently and the referee's report just came back uh, just last week and so I'm hoping that we'll have the final uh, changes and the paper will soon um, be accepted. Um, on the basis of the discovery of this long GRB, which I, I'll just point out a long GRB is the type of burst which is usually associated with the collapse of a massive star rather than short GRBs, which are typically the mergers of two, um, two stars, neutron stars. Um, so this long GRB um, uh, was something which uh, we motivated for a meerkat uh, director's discretionary time observation, which uh, I think Marcus actually uh, wrote uh, the, the proposal to do that. Uh, and we were um, successful in getting observations for that, but sometime after the event. Um, uh, so anyway, the, the interesting point about this is that for the first time we have 
spectropolarimetric measurements of a gamma ray burst. There's been plenty of, of normal imaging polarimetry observations of GRBs in the past, but doing spectropolarimetry where you're looking at the wavelength dependency of the polarization is really a hard task when these objects are typically so faint. So we were just very lucky with this particular source that it was so bright. And so the results shown on the left there are the pause observations, which were taken later during the outburst. And the, the ones on the right um, are the, the SALT RSS spectropolarimetry observations. And the takeaway from this is that it's a lowly polarized object at about the one to one and a half percent level, um, which is uh, not, uh, not particularly high, um, but not uncommon in GRB. Some show uh, much uh, higher polarizations, um, but those are typically systems in which there is a reverse shock that develops in the, in the GRB. And so the results that we presented in this paper is uh, consistent with a normal forward shock, uh, but the little plateau uh, phase that I showed earlier where the, uh, the brightness levels out for a bit or even gets a little bit brighter is explained by what's called a refreshed shock where slower moving material ejected um, during the GRB outburst catches up with the decelerated initial material causing a sort of rebrightening phase. So uh, the other thing we did, as I said, we, we managed to motivate and succeed in, in getting a meerkat observation as well. And this shows the, the meerkat detection uh, but at a later date, typically uh, the radio uh, flux is uh, seen um, often 20 to 30 days after the event. Uh, and so with all of the um, activities over Christmas and the holiday period, and then not really thinking about whether we should do a, um, a DDT, we eventually decided we should, and, uh, and this was the result. So it's a nice positive detection of a GRB about a month after the event, um, not, a, not um, atypical for, for gamma ray bursts. So that's the explosive event I wanted to talk about. And you know, the takeaway for this is that we were just very lucky to be able to get uh, onto this when the source was bright to do the spectropolarimetry. On the other hand, we we're also very unlucky because master uh, has normally uh, the ability also to conduct imaging polarimetry because it has two telescopes with polarizing filters that can be oriented at the two uh, angles of polarization um, perpendicular to each other to get some idea of, of um, linear polarimetry. Um, and uh, unfortunately, one of the CCD cameras, the Apogee CCD cameras on one of the master telescopes had failed earlier that month, and therefore we weren't able to do uh, the imaging polarimetry, which would have been really interesting to see its behavior in the early part of the outburst uh, be before the refreshed shock event, uh, the plateau event that I mentioned. Anyway, you lose some, you win some. Bottom line is I think we did quite well with what we, what we did. I'm going to move on now to uh, X-ray transients because this has been uh, an area of uh, quite a lot of uh, increasing um, investigations within the program. Um, it's something which covers the whole gambit of, uh, of X-ray binaries, high mass X-ray binaries, which uh, have uh, um, typically um, giant companions, early type giant companions with with typically neutron star accretors. These are, for example, the B X-ray binary uh, subclass of high mass X-ray binaries. And these have been a topic of, uh, of a lot of recent work done by my collaborators, for example, Malcolm Co at Southampton, E2, um, Monaghan here um, at SAO, um, Lee Townsend, Vanessa McBride. So, this is an area where we've been following up on um, uh, variability and discoveries of new examples of the B X-ray binaries, but I'm not going to talk about those today. Uh, this is a topic that I think my collaborators could easily talk about, like Ito, I think, has already given a talk recently on this. 
Uh, so I'm going to talk mostly about one low mass X-ray binary and the low mass systems are, as the name suggests, their uh, mass donors are, are, are low mass stars, typically sort of solar or le even less massive uh, in much shorter orbits than, for example, the high mass X-ray binaries. Um, but they show the similar sort of phenomena of accretion disks and, and uh, in some cases, the development of jets and a sort of whole outburst cycle where where the disk goes into an extended bright state. Um, during that time, a jet can develop. Um, it can cause uh, uh, irradiation of the secondary. So this little cartoon shows all the different components that typically make up uh, an X-ray binary. And then in recent times, we've also started looking at a small subclass of of unusual low mass X-ray binaries. There's only a handful of them known, only a few confirmed and a, a couple of other candidate systems, which are called transitional millisecond pulsars. These are also binaries, but they, um, of the low mass X-ray binary type, but they, they transition between an accretion state where there's a disk like shown here, um, but sometimes the, uh, the accretion turns off because presumably the mass transfer decreases and the magnetic field of the neutron star is sufficient to, to actually propel the material out when the ma mass accretion rate drops. And so accretion turns off. Uh, and at that point, they transition into uh, a radio millisecond pulsar. Um, and so one of these, uh, we've, we've actually observed now three such systems uh, within the transient program and also more dedicated follow-up programs. Uh, and more recently, a candidate was observed with um, both SALT um, and also with the XMM uh, Newton uh, X-ray telescope and, um, and also uh, with Meerkat uh, through the open time call. Uh, and so I don't have time to talk about that. Suffice to say that there was a detection by Meerkat um, and work is continuing. We're having a campaign on this object, hopefully, well, it, it definitely next March. So uh, the one system I want to talk about is this system called SWIFT 1357-0933. It's one of uh, these low mass X-ray binaries. In this case, it contains a, a black hole. It's been known for some time. There's been regular outbursts since 2012. Um, and SALT has followed the last two outbursts using some of the uh, really um, compelling instrumentation that we have on SALT, which allows us to do high time resolution photometry and time resolved spectroscopy. And these light curves here show uh, the results of the slot mode photometry with uh, 0.15 second sampling. And those dips that you see are actually happening at typically a uh, hundred seconds or a few hundred seconds. But the interesting thing is that they evolve to lower and lower frequencies over time. You can see the dip, uh, the dips come uh, more further apart uh, later during the outburst of this. Uh, and interestingly, there's absolutely no correlation at all between the optical and X-ray. Um, so the results of the photometric, uh, photometric work on this were published by uh, John Pace, who is a student uh, at Southampton with Hoshak, Gandhi, and Phil Charles and others. Um, and, um, and basically, the, the picture that's um, evolved for the system is that although it's not eclipsing, it's still quite a um, high inclination system. Um, and the reason why we believe this is because we think the dips are caused by uh, extended regions of the inner part of the disk, which uh, periodically occult the central source uh, as those blobs in the inner part of the disk move around with a Keplerian velocity of typically a few hundred seconds, what we see in the photometry. So this is the picture that was um, developed uh, from the photometry alone. But uh, during the 2017 and then 2018 um, outbursts, we also conducted time-resolved spectroscopy. And this is one of the, the sort of unique aspects of SALT that we can do this time-resolved spectroscopy with no dead time between the exposures. 
Uh, and what we see here is spectra which show these dips or absorptions happening periodically in the main emission lines like H alpha, um, H beta, the Bauma series, and helium two. Um, and uh, <coughs> this was quite um, something that, that Phil Charles was very intrigued about when we first made this discovery because helium two and absorption is typically not seen in X-ray binaries. Um, you, you need particularly hot and uh, dense conditions to produce such, um, uh, such absorption. Um, but uh, we nonetheless uh, had a follow-up paper that Phil led on the SALT results. Uh, and this included some modeling done by James Matthews who, uh, who used his models to show that in fact that the results are consistent with what you expect from uh, a disk wind, a hot disk wind emanating from the central source, which has to be at a very high X-ray luminosity, much higher than had been previously thought. Uh, and the, the reason why we don't see it as a particularly strong X-ray source is because it's mostly centrally obscured. So that was uh, published last year. And then there was also a second outburst in 2019. And in this, we did the same type of observations. And <clears throat> this is uh, another intriguing result that we didn't see because of, uh, well, basically because we didn't have quite the same time resolution. But again, you see these absorption uh, dips, but what you see is some structure. Maybe hopefully you can see that they're not lined up in velocity. They're all slightly blue shifted, but as you come into a dip, you see the absorption is far more blue shifted and then moves uh, to uh, lower uh, velocity. Um, and so this is uh, a new result. I had a, a student who was working on this for his uh, uh, NASP honors program last year, basically measuring the velocity change over the hundred or so seconds that these dips occurred. Uh, and the explanation First of all, we thought it was maybe evidence for deceleration of the outflow, uh, but we now think it's probably more a geometrical effect. So that's, um, uh, that covers the sort of two recent uh, results that I wanted to highlight as examples of, of uh, high energy transients. But now I'm going to talk briefly about the Irizita follow-up, which has started this year following uh, an MOU that was developed by the, uh, between the, the transient team and uh, Max Planck Institute for Extraterrestrial Physics in Gashi, who are responsible for the Irizita German half of the sky. Uh, this is a rather unusual situation where half of the sky is split between the Russians and the Germans. Um, and we have a MOU to follow up uh, transients from uh, the German half of the sky, uh, which happens to include for example, uh, the Magellanic clouds, but also um, uh, parts of the galactic plane as well. Um, separately, we also working with the Russians on their um, uh, follow-up of some of the sources from their uh, experiment on the uh, Spectrum RG um, uh, instrument. So some of the things that we've been following up on uh, uh, related to AGN, um, and in particular, things which are uh, on the left are shown as so-called quasi-periodic um, eruptions, which are a relatively new phenomena that has been uh, found by Eurozita, but also uh, looking at how some AGN go through uh, sort of changes in, um, in activity. Um, they can either suddenly shut down or suddenly ignite. And so we've been Your following up. Eruption. Sorry? Uh, sorry? Your eruption. Sorry, it was um, So here's some examples of some light curves of these uh, quasi-periodic uh, eruptions. Two objects that have been followed up by SALT where we've determined uh, the distances uh, from the spectra that is shown below. Um, and there's a paper in preparation on the results of these quasi-periodic oscillations, uh, eruptions, I should say. Um, and then also some tidal disruption events. Um, so these are also discovered by E. Rosita. Um, 
And uh, so salt spectroscopy has revealed, for example, changes in the, uh, in the spectra of these um, sources, um, which are related to them uh, developing as tidal disruption events. And then the final um, Erosita work has been on an interesting accreting compact white dwarf binary, um, which we don't know the nature of it at all at the moment. We're not sure whether it's, for example, a, a low mass system like a cataclysmic variable or more akin to something uh, like a symbiotic. But it's a, a source which has shown both optical variability and X-ray variability. It's quite bright at 12th magnitude. Um, so it's something that sort of escaped uh, attention. Um, and a recent observation by SALT, the spectrum is shown from HRS, because it's so bright uh, on the right bottom there, showing strong helium-2, which is the, the line on the, uh, the far right, and the Bowen fluorescence lines of carbon and nitrogen, uh, indicative of a soft ionizing source. Um, and so this has been something which, in fact, I followed up just last week with doing high-speed photometry on this, and hopefully Patrick will get some more data because this is a brand new object that we know nothing about. So those are examples of some um, work that's followed from Erosita, and then I'm going to um, finish with a discussion on the, the June uh, campaign on ARSCO. Um, ARSCO, as I said earlier, has been a bit of an obsession with mine and uh, to some extent with Steve Potter and others as well, when it was first discovered in 2016, uh, and we did observations with the HIPPO instrument on the 1.9 meter and discovered it's a strongly pulsed polarized source reaching up to 40% linear polarization. Um, all of the other observations that have been conducted by other groups, particularly Tom Marsh's group at Warwick, um, indicated that this is a, an unusual system with multi-wavelength pulsed non-thermal synchrotron emission. And the explanation is that it's powered by the spin down of a strongly magnetic white dwarf, um, akin really to a pulsar, um, except of course it's not a neutron star. So we've been observing this um, off and on for, for some time and uh, following work that we've been doing uh, on photometry of the system um, where we've combined efforts with uh, Peter Garnovich, who's an astronomer at Notre Dame University. Um, we decided to coordinate with Salt and Keck for a spectroscopy campaign in June, uh, where uh, Peter was able to get some Keck time. Um, and the idea was to compare previous studies and look to see if there were transient spectral features that were expected from the models that have developed with the interaction between the magnetosphere of the spinning white dwarf and the coronal loops of the um, companion M star. And so uh, we conducted salt spectroscopy over four, uh, three nights. Uh, this was supported by simultaneous optical high-speed photometry. And then lo and behold, quite fortuitously and serendipitously, through um, a very nice piece of code that Marissa Kotzer runs daily, um, this interrogates all the satellite scheduling that's happening and um, flags any overlapping with potential salt windows. And we discovered quite fortuitously that ARSCO was scheduled on those same nights to be observed by the NICER X-ray telescope. Um, by an astronomer at Columbia University I subsequently contacted and we were both totally amazed that just by pure luck we ended up having simultaneous optical and x-ray observations and on the basis of that we then appealed to uh, SARO to do a meerkat DDT observation which was granted and we got a total of two and a half hours of time on two of the nights the 15th and 16th overlapping with both our photometry, salt observations, and the X-ray data. And so this has been work that's involved a number of my collaborators listed here at SAO and also a student um, at the University of the Free State. And the results are truly amazing. This just shows um, some of the trailed spectra uh, that were obtained with salt. There's 
six tracks in total, so I'm only showing three of them here. Uh, and these were taken with 10 second exposures and no dead time um, in frame transfer mode. And so time moves upwards in the uh, Y axis. Uh, and what you can see is the evolution of the structure of the line, but you can also see its stripy nature. And that's because the lines are pulsed in both the continuum, which you can hardly see there, but if you change the, uh, the lookup table, you can see that there's also pulsations out in the continuum. Um, but they're not constant. Those, those horizontal streaks actually show some curvature showing that there's a phase change with wavelength across the line. This is brand new data uh, or brand new discovery never seen before. And these data actually blow away anything that can even be achieved with Keck. Keck can do similar time resolution, 15 seconds, but it takes 40 seconds to read out the spectrum. So there's gaps between all of their spectrum. And so this has led Steve uh, and Enrico to work on the tomography of the system. Uh, and on the left, you see the trailed spectrum over uh, two orbits. Um, and you can see we have almost perfect phase coverage. Uh, those little gaps there are just reflecting where we didn't have coverage, but those are actually filled in by about one hour of Keck observations. Uh, Peter didn't get as much time as he'd hoped, partly because Keck had been closed for COVID reasons. And on the night of his observation, it was the first time it had been open, I think for a month, and they had a number of technical issues that impacted on the total observing time. But Steve has run um, tomography on the system and in particular using Enrico's novel Inside Out Tomography. Um, and the top tomogram is showing the orbital uh, Inside Out Tomogram. And the bottom one is news hot off the press because Steve just sent it to me this morning. So I quickly pasted it into my presentation. Uh, and this is what's called the spin tomogram where instead of phase binning on the orbital period, which is 3.6 hours, the, uh, the central trail spectrum is showing it binned on the, on the uh, spin period, which is 117 seconds. And what this is basically telling us is that the emission region is not coming anywhere from the accretion stream that you would expect, which is this arc here, if there was accretion in the system, which we believe there is not, it's instead coming from a region which is trailing the secondary as it rotates around in the orbital frame, this region of enhanced emission here, which has a little connection, as you can see, to where the white dwarf is. And this seems to be on the face of it entirely consistent with our model, whereby the magnetic field is trapping electrons, the magnetic field of the white dwarf is trapping electrons from the chromosphere or corona. Of the, of the companion. Um, and then these relativistic electrons emit uh, producing uh, polarized emission. Um, and you can see in the Doppler uh, tomogram on the spin, two pulses, which would be uh, a natural consequence of the two poles with one of them more dominant because it's the favored one from our aspect. So that was a beautiful data. We got beautiful supporting uh, photometry consistent with previous observations. That hash there that you see, the sort of spikes are not, um, are not noise. They're actually uh, the pulses that are happening on the two minute time scale or the harmonic of the two minute. And that's just one example. The DDT observation with Meerkat was very successful. Um, this shows the image on the left, which Dante Hewitt was able to produce. Um, compared to the VLA observation, which uh, the contours on the right at uh, similar um, frequency. Um, <clears throat> this was subsequently analyzed by Spencer at the University of the Free State. Uh, and we obtained these uh, light curves in the radio, which show quite a lot of uh, variation in radio intensity on the different nights that it was observed. But more importantly, we are seeing the the spin modulation in the Meerkat data, which is not seen at the similar frequency in yellow here of the VLA data. They do see it at high frequencies and not in low frequencies. And this just reflects, I think, the 
much increased sensitivity that Meerkat has. And when he, uh, when Spencer did his uh, um, power spectrum analysis, uh, lo and behold, the spin period um, leaps out, uh, as you can see here in these different uh, peaks for the both the uh, fundamental spin, not so much at the uh, harmonic. Compared to, for example, the VLA observation where there was nothing detected, this is where you'd expect to see the spin. And then finally, uh, this is uh, the result of the nicer observations where again, the X-rays are seen quite clearly on the spin period and also on the harmonics. And so from this data set, we will have uh, simultaneous uh, X-ray optical radio observation will be able to relatively phase all of these light curves and it will give us huge insights into what's actually happening in this unusual system. So I'm now going to finish with the last two parts that I um, promised to talk about, which is the next sort of developments in, in transients related to the SALT transient program, but also wider than that. Uh, and one of them relates to LSST, or as it's now called the Rubin um, Observatory. In fact, the acronym LSST has been kept, but instead of standing for Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, it stands for the Legacy Survey of Space and Time, which is the 10-year the survey that will be conducted beginning probably late 2023 or probably 2024, given the construction delays due to COVID. Um, and so South Africa has already been involved for over a year um, in this project through uh, the granting of PI affiliate ships to three of us within South Africa. But the large, uh, the, the big development that's happened just now is that um, the, the whole sort of mechanism for how we contribute has changed from a sort of cash contribution that was happening before to a contribution of in-kind. And uh, so the in-kind contributions, uh, 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 some of them focused on follow-up of transients and variable sources discovered by LSST by the wealth of facilities that we have in South Africa, uh, including the optical telescopes at SAO, uh, Meerkat, uh, and SALT obviously as well. Um, and so if our proposal is accepted, this will um, increase the number of, uh, of PI groups that can have access to proprietary data um, from the get-go from the LSST survey. So it has a, a huge opportunity for, for transient science work within South Africa. Of course, I'm saying here opportunities for postgraduate students because um, myself and my team involved in the transient follow-up are, are being constantly on the lookout to, to appoint more postgraduate students within this program. Uh, we've had two for a while. One has just left, Dante is moving on to do a PhD in the Netherlands. Uh, we have one PhD student in, um, at the University of the Free State and another one coming soon, but so we still have opportunities to fill two other such positions. And then finally, I'm just going to talk about uh, something into the future that I hope we'll see uh, developed, which is something called the BRICS Intelligent Telescope and Data Network. Um, and so BRICS has an astronomy working group. It's been operating since I think 2015. Um, and uh, back in 2017, it was decided that BRICS should really have uh, a flagship program in astronomy and, and proposals were, were called for back at that time. Uh, they were finally resolved into two major proposals on transients, which I led, and one on big data and big compute that Russ Taylor led, um, respectively connecting to the two big facilities. One I've already mentioned, uh, the Rubin Observatory, LSST, and obviously the other one, the SKA. And so last year in October, when the Brooks Astronomy Working Group meeting met, they decided to merge these into one single proposal. And that's what is now going forward uh, to uh, request funding to develop this in the future. And 
it will involve both using existing from a transient point of view at least using the existing facilities within the BRICS countries doing things like has already started with uh, being led by Steve Potter on developing the the so-called intelligent observatory on the Sutherland Plateau but extending it to other observatories within BRICS and then a far more ambitious uh, second phase would be the build of a large network of new one meter wide field telescopes, uh, which is some project which is already on the books in China called Citium, with the aim of these telescopes being distributed globally, uh, which would give four pi steradians coverage, the entire sky covered uh, with a cadence of less than an hour. And so this is pushing to, in this diagram that shows cadence and magnitude, it's this sort of gray circle here, which is pushing not very deeply compared to say LSST, which is shown over here, but the cadence is um, two orders of magnitude faster. So it opens a whole new potential discovery pace, space for fast transients over the entire sky. So we will see how this goes. Um, today, in fact, the senior officials of BRICS are discussing this program. So I'm hoping to hear what the outcome is for this going forward. And that brings me to the end of my talk. Thank you. Thanks, David. Yeah, so we've got some opportunity for questions. Um, Please feel free to turn your cameras on or just chip in, start chatting, or you can raise your hand if you like. So uh, I'll get, I'll kick things off. Uh, David, do you have any estimates observationally for the magnetic field strength of AASCO? Yes, um, in our original nature astronomy paper that Steve, myself, um, Peter Meinkes, who was our sort of theoretician on the paper, uh, we thought it must be something at least 200 megagauss. Um, and that comes from arguments of the fact that it's powered by spin down. This is a, a spinning down uh, white dwarf. And because it's not accreting, um, the only explanation for the power of the system is just the dipole radiation of a spinning down magnetic dipole. And so for it to, to, to spin down at that rate, the interaction, the torque that is produced by the interaction of the magnetic field of the white dwarf and its companion has to be sufficient to explain that large um, P dot term, spin down term. And the, the arguments on just on the basis of the observed spin down and the parameters of the system say that the, the magnetic field has to be more than about 200 megagauss. Now, this has been um, uh, disputed at least by one paper where people are claiming that this is more like a traditional intermediate polar, like, uh, you know, with maybe 10 megagauss or something like that. But um, in my mind, uh, this is totally untenable because uh, there's just absolutely no evidence that, is, that, that the uh, secondary star is filling its Roche load. There's no evidence of mass transfer, like, for example, in other systems that you might think are similar, like A. Aquarius, where there's demonstrable mass loss and mass transfer in the system. For all intents and purposes, this shows it's just a detached system, but with these other bizarre um, characteristics. Great. The salt uh, trail spectra are just fantastic, aren't they? They're absolutely. I mean, Peter Garnovich, when I showed it to him, he said, oh, he just groaned. He said, you know, it's just like blows the socks off what Keck can do. You know, it's not often you hear that, but it's just the fact that, you know, we, we knew what we wanted when we designed these instruments and we wanted to do time result studies whereas a lot of other instruments on large telescopes, they're sort of after, you know, they're, 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 um, they're thought of afterwards. And uh, I think that reflects the fact that, and also, you know, our polarimetric capabilities, 
often polarimetry is an add-on which is often compromised because of, uh, of the design of telescopes. So we really are building on the competitive advantage that salt has in certain areas. You know, we hear, of course, that you know it's nowhere near as good in Chile. Uh, I mean, in, in Sutherland as Chile in conditions, that's, that's absolutely true. Um, but we, we win out in other ways. Hi, Dave. This is uh, Diego. No, I don't know if you can hear me. Or oh, I can you. see you, Diego. Yeah, hi. Hi. Uh, can you go a uh, slide backward, back? Yes, yeah, sure. How far one. back? <laughs> Only this one, this one. Actually, it was about the, this uh, intelligent telescope data network. Yes. Um, maybe I got it. Uh, I, you said it, but uh, at which stage is it and how? Yes. I mean, so it's at the stage where um, this year uh, at our meeting, uh, we presented the final proposal, which was accepted and has been uh, put forward now to what is called the senior officials groups of the BRICS countries related to science. So it's at the stage now where it's been endorsed by the Astronomy Working Group as the program to have as a flagship. Mm -hmm. um, the next stage is, of course, to put them their money, the money where their mouth is, um, because you know if you're going to have a flagship, you have to fund it, and yeah. so it can't be done with the the same level of funding that previous BRICS related or even bilaterals between uh, South Africa and other BRICS countries, which has been fairly modest amount that really hasn't had a lot of money for development of infrastructure, new facilities, instrumentation, and so on. So this uh, proposal now reflects uh, a budget where we're asking for, for example, 12 PhD scholarships and 12 postdoc positions distributed amongst the BRICS countries. It has a project manager for the development of the networking of telescopes, has a project manager for the outreach aspects of the program. It has uh, a budget request to build four prototype one meter telescopes. Um, and so the total budget request is something like 33 million euros to do all of that, um, which sounds a lot, uh, but when you think that it's actually spread out over, over nine years um, and it's split with five countries, it's not more than about, uh, there's less than a million a year, uh, euros a year, 700,000 uh, euros a year. Um, Do you know if, uh, if they are open to collaborations with uh, non-BRIC countries? Well, this is a good question, Diego, because um, at the moment, this is, is being framed within the BRICS group uh, because of the desire for BRICS to work together uh, to do something compelling in astronomy. Uh, and we were told back when this began that there was potential to, uh, to sort of leverage funding from maybe not the traditional areas where science funding comes from, but because this is, is almost a political organization and it involves a development bank, a BRICS development bank, uh, that maybe the funding could come through other sources. Um, so at the moment, the way it's couched is that this is definitely a BRICS-led uh, program. But of course, I'm fully expecting, uh, and in fact, even uh, there's already been discussions, for example, about where we site if, if it expands into phase two with this massive uh, 71 meter telescopes around the world um, that, that they may be uh, sighted in other countries not related to BRICS like Australia or Chile or somewhere like that. Um, yeah, I was thinking more with my hat of Argentina, not hat of uh, UK, just to clarify. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, so I think uh, it's early days, of course, and um, uh, you know, I don't know what the outcome is going to be. Hopefully we'll hear that um, fairly soon. Uh, but I really hope that uh, we would see this as something that uh, could involve people outside of BRICS. And, and I'm really hoping also that for Africa, 
um, given the fact that uh, astronomy is really starting to develop in, in other countries in Africa, that this could be some leverage into uh, helping with development if, if other African countries also became involved in this program. Um, but as you know, we're, we're living in a time where there's not exactly a lot of funding uh, available. Um, and so we probably have to start modestly and uh, we, we've actually have that in our development plan to begin with the facilities we already have and start with, for example, the work that's already begun at SAO with the networking of the, of the um, uh, other steerable telescopes, which as I mentioned, Steve Potter is leading that. Uh, and so we start modestly, but hopefully grow um, and uh, yeah, I've talked really about the intelligent uh, or the, the sort of follow-up telescope network, but there's equally important um, arm to this project, which is the data, big data, big compute aspect, which Russ Taylor um, is leading, which is leveraging, for example, what will happen with SKA um, in the future as a big data um, producer. Any final questions for David? Well, I don't know if anybody is frantically trying to unmute themselves, but if not. I just want to say that what I've presented here is, is the work of a team. Uh, and I think, you know, it's, it's a team effort that's um, been the success of this program to date. Uh, and I'm really optimistic uh, that this will continue to grow, um, involving both uh, people within South Africa, but also our partners overseas. And uh, I'm really gratified to see, you know, the impact we're making. Uh, and when I hear also very positive reports from my, uh, my colleagues overseas at, you know, sort of places like Caltech and others where they really admire what we've been able to do, um, I think, you know, there's huge potential. So I'm really hoping to see that this program develops in, in the years to come, and particularly sort of during the, the period with the Rubin Observatory LSST survey. Yeah, that's a good point. And for any students watching, go onto our website and look, there's been a number of advertisements for for uh, positions over the uh, last year or so and postdoc positions. I think we don't have any openings right now, but uh, uh, for scholarships at least, but certainly I'd be keen to hear from people who would like to get involved in, in this. So that's sao.ac.za, is it? Well, that's where our um, job opportunities have been posted, but there's descriptions of those programs there if people want to go and find out a little bit more, like, for example, what we were planning to do with the, um, the Rubin Observatory program. OK, well, in that case, uh, thanks very much, uh, David. And uh, we'll let you know what the, the seminar is for next week. Thanks a lot. Bye. Thanks, Dave. Thanks.